First, if you're observant, you notice the background has changed. Got tired of the US map and the hockey, so I moved to a different room in the house. Um, second, where we left off, sort of gone around in circles here, we ended up with uh, how does Andrew Johnson become president? Obviously, he becomes president when uh, Lincoln is assassinated and he's the vice president. Why is the vice president? This goes back to the election of 1864. Talked about the election of 1864. I talked about some of the issues, loyalty or disloyalty, uh, race and Lincoln, prisoners of war. But ultimately, when we get right down to it, Lincoln's reelection pinned on the war, the war, the war. It was probably more important than all the other issues combined. If Lincoln was going to win re-election, he was going to win re-election based on the fact that the North seemed to be winning the Civil War. And this connects us back to U.S. Grant. U.S. Grant. So Grant gets his sort of, uh, he rises in Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. Um, his job over in 62 and 63 is to clear the Mississippi River. Remember part of the Anaconda plan to choke off the Confederacy by driving uh, up the Mississippi River from New Orleans, from the Gulf of Mexico, uh, down the Mississippi River. The main obstacle in the Mississippi River was a stretch of the Mississippi between Port Hudson, Louisiana and Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, in 1863, Grant, same time the Union is winning the Battle of Vicksburg, Grant captures Vicksburg. And after Grant captures Vicksburg, Lincoln realizes that while he's cycling through generals in the east from uh, McDowell to McClellan to uh, Burnside, Hooker, um, to Meade, um, he realizes what he needs to do is look out west. And west is where he's going to find his generals, uh, particularly Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman will uh, come from the west as well. In early 1864, Lincoln proclaims, Grant is my man and I'm his for the rest of the year. Brings him back east, promotes him to the rank of Lieutenant General. No one had been a Lieutenant General since George Washington. Grant, however, is not a man who's gonna sit behind a desk in Washington. What he does is he agrees to be Lieutenant General of the US Army, but he wants to keep his, basically his position in command of the Army of the Potomac, facing off against Lee. We think about Lee and Grant in the war. Well, starting in 1864 is when Lee and Grant face off against each other. Henry Halleck remains in Washington to sort of do the administrative duties. He had been Grant's supervisor actually earlier in the year, or earlier in the war. But Grant is a fighting general. He's not a desk general at all. Grant and Lincoln come plan for 1864. So here you see on the map here, you can see where Vicksburg is. You see where Port Hudson is. That is now cleared. Um, you can see sort of Sherman's march to the sea, which will occur in 1864 as well there. Sherman leading the Army of the West there. But that's only part of 1864. Here's in terms of 1864 strategy that Grant and Lincoln come up with. It's, it's really a brilliant idea. And it's an idea that was sort of ahead of its time, but really something any of us could think, we think it's kind of obvious. If you're the superior side in terms of numbers, and clearly we all know the Union is superior in terms of numbers, munitions, everything else, you want to use that numerical superiority. So what you want to do is you want to apply pressure in all areas at once. So, or as Lincoln said, those not skinning can hold a leg. So Sherman, that arrow in the middle of the screen, will push towards Atlanta with the Army of the West. At the top of the screen, you can see where it says Meade, but but think about me being uh, Grant really there. Um, we'll push against Lee's army. Down here on the bottom, you see Banks going to Mobile, Alabama. You see Franz Siegel in the sort of top highest blue arrow there. Benjamin Butler there. So the idea is that to prevent the Confederacy from taking advantage of its interior lines, um, basically if the Union attacked in all these areas at once, if Sherman attacked and occupied the Confederacy's main army of the West under Joseph E. Johnston, if Meade, like I said, Meade will be Grant in this case, uses the Army of the Potomac against Robert E. Lee's army, then Butler and Siegel and Banks will prevent other armies from relieving them, sending them reinforcements, provide pressure elsewhere. Frankly, the guys holding the leg did a terrible job. Banks doesn't even actually go to Mobile. Banks attacks up the Mississippi River, up the, the Red River to the northwest here, it's a failure. Siegel doesn't do much in the valley. In fact, he's probably supposed to be chasing Jubal Early, who eventually in 1864 will himself invade, go by Washington, burn Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. Butler is a political general, not a military general, do a poor job there as well. So we end up primarily with Grant versus Lee and uh, Sherman versus Johnston. And so there you have sort of this is the failed Red River campaign of Banks here. Um, this is Butler's campaign, which goes nowhere. And Banks to Grant. Grant will, in 1864, attack Robert E. Lee in what's known as the Overland Campaign, a series of battles. You can see at the top here, it starts on May 7th, 1860, May 5th, 
to 7th, 1864, May 8th, May 20th. And you notice it keeps going farther and farther and farther south. And the interesting thing is, Grant in 1864 does not seem to be winning a lot of these battles. So we start with the Battle of the Wilderness in May of 1864. Grant recognized he had about twice as many troops as Lee did, roughly 120 to 130,000 to 64,000 men there. And Grant wants to get that army into open field, open combat. But the first time the battle takes place is actually in the wood, in a forest area called, after really, the wilderness. As you can imagine, the wilderness is not a wide open field. Um, this negates part of Grant's advantage. And Grant effectively loses, uh, or certainly doesn't win, in the Battle of the Wilderness. But Grant says, you know what? Okay, I've lost the battle here. And if you really see this on the right, what happens every time he loses the battle, instead of retreating back to Washington, D.C., he sort of bounces and tries to do a flanking movement around Lee. And that flanking movement, as it continues to move south, will work its way, not even to Richmond, but past Richmond, ultimately down to Petersburg. And that's where you're eventually gonna see Grant doesn't have to beat Lee, he doesn't have to crush, doesn't have to destroy these lines. If he can cut the railroad to Richmond, if he can trap Lee there, Lee might have to um, retreat and the Confederacy might have to evacuate Richmond. So he doesn't have to win all these battles. He just has to keep applying constant pressure. And people recognize this about Grant. Grant, I'm heartily tired of hearing about what Lee is gonna do. Some of you always think he's suddenly gonna turn a double somersault and land on our rear and both flanks at the same time. Go back to your command and try to think of what we're gonna do ourselves instead of what Lee is gonna do. So here's Grant's idea. He comes from the West and he felt the Army of the Potomac had really a defeatist attitude. They believed that they were facing an unconquerable enemy. While Lee had lost at Antietam and Lee had lost at Gettysburg, he had never lost a, when he had home field advantage. He'd never lost on Virginia soil. And so Grant's trying to restore the morale. And that's part of the reason when he doesn't win at Wilderness, instead of going back to Washington, D.C., he keeps applying pressure on Lee, makes Lee react to him. Um, in the words of better, one of my favorite quotes. Here was a new federal general, fresh from the West, so ill-informed as to the military customs in our part of the country that when the Battle of the Wilderness was over, instead of retiring to the north bank of the river and awaiting the development of these plans, he had the temerity, the boldness, to move by his left flank to a new position thereby to try conclusions with us again. In other words, Grant wasn't following the old rules of warfare. He didn't understand that when the Union lost, they retreated. Instead, the Union loses here and continues to apply pressure. This might work in the long run, but in the short run, it produces a lot of casualties, and this becomes critical. Um, the most famous or most infamous example of this occurs on June 3rd, 1864 at Cold Harbor. Um, Cold Harbor is not a harbor in the sense that uh, it involves the ocean here. Cold Harbor is essentially um, a sort of a, a low surface uh, tavern here. You know, it didn't have, a, it wasn't a full surface tavern there. So it's outside of uh, Richmond, Virginia. And Grant orders an assault at Cold Harbor. And there are a couple of famous things about this. Supposedly it's one of the bloodiest assaults in the world, in the history of the war. 8,000 casualties, that's killed, wounded, missing, not just killed, in about a half hour. Um, there's this reputed story where someone writes in his diary, a soldier writes in his diary, June 3rd, 1864, Cold Harbor, I was killed. In fact, the, the troops knew it was a suicidal uh, mission there. And so they find the Bible, of course, the, the diary in the Bible where it has scribbled in there, um, blood stained, and here it is, a dead soldier on the ground. Did it happen? Possibly. Um, we're not 100% sure on that. Grant, I've always regretted that the last assault at Cold Harbor was ever made. No advantage, whatever was gained to compensate for the heavy losses that was sustained. So Grant's pounding into Lee, pounding into Lee, pounding into Lee. He's not winning battles. And in fact, he suffers 64,000 casualties in the summer of 1864. Um, so he suffers as many casualties as Lee had troops during that campaign. This is where Grant gets a reputation as a butcher or somebody who's just going to apply the simple law of numbers to win a battle. Um, one of the last of these battles occurs outside of Petersburg. And if you look here on the left, you can see the trenches outside of Petersburg. They look a lot like World War I trenches. You can see Petersburg is south of Richmond, Virginia. People had dug in here. Um, glorious charge wasn't going to work, but what happens is some engineers from Pennsylvania come up with the idea of building a tunnel underneath the Confederate works and blowing it up. They said it couldn't be done. But these guys, a lot of time, they were entrenched in there anyway. They said, okay, give it a shot. And they build this tunnel. And on July, June, July 30th, uh, 1864, um, the Union explodes 
uh, crater. It's called the Battle of the Crater underneath these trenches at Petersburg. Um, and they initially gain surprise, but they're poorly trained as to what to do in it. Essentially, troops run into the crater. And this is what you can see on the top example there. If you've ever seen the movie Cold Mountain, it's the scene that occurs at the start of this. So, well, they blew a hole in it, but then the Union troops like sort of move into the hole, which means that they're being shot from the above. And the Confederates are outside this hole in the ground. And the cold heart of the uh, Battle of the Crater is another Union defeat. It's in the midst of all these defeats that the quote I used in the last mini lecture um, that Lincoln has this idea that we're going to lose because the war doesn't seem to be being won. Well, what changes between August 23rd and November election of 1864 is that the Union does seem to be victorious. Particularly, this associates with William Tecumseh Sherman. Sherman, one of Grant's lieutenants from out in the West, is leading the Army of the West, and he is pushing towards Atlanta against a man named Joseph E. Johnston, one of the Confederate's most prominent generals. As Grant orders Sherman, move against Johnston's army, break it up, get into the interior of the enemy's country as far as you can, inflicting all the damage you can against its resources. And this, we've talked about, a lot of people wrote about total war. Sherman lives off the land. One of the advantages the Confederacy had, people talk about, is that the Union would have to move south in the Confederacy, maintain a supply line. Well, Sherman's gonna not do that. He's gonna live off the land while he does some on the way to Atlanta, but certainly after um, he leaves Atlanta. And Sherman will push Johnston back. And Johnston's um, retreat from Tennessee down to Atlanta is a masterpiece of retreat. People don't die. He keeps his army intact. But that doesn't sound very exciting. Um, it's not really appealing. Uh, eventually, he'll be replaced by John Bell Hood, a man who only can do his charge. And he'll charge at the Union Army um, and fail. And ultimately, Sherman will maneuver the Confederates out of Atlanta and when he maneuvers out of Atlanta, the Union Army will take Atlanta in September of 1864. And now the war all of a sudden will look like Union victories in sight after a stalemate for almost a year. They get Atlanta, Grant's providing pressure. There's actually some good things happen in the Shenandoah Valley uh, where Philip Sheridan is chasing after Jubal Early and making the, uh, making the uh, Shenandoah Valley suffer. And now victory is, seen, is in sight. And that is what happens when the North goes to the election in 1864. While the election is important because it's a wartime election, um, soldiers vote sort of absentee ballot, um, it's really not that close. With the fact that now it seems with the capture of Atlanta and some decimation in the valley and the pressure put on Petersburg and Richmond, um, Lincoln wins an overwhelming electoral college mandate, 212 to 21 electoral votes. Closer in the popular vote, but still, this is an overwhelming victory. And when this victory occurs in 1864, it's pretty clear at this point that this war is gonna go on. There's gonna be not a negotiation. It's gonna go on until one side achieves victory or the other. Thank you.